Hi everyone. Good to see you guys. I'm here in my office. Here we go. It's not a very big office, but it suits my needs. <laughs> so uh, I am not able to do Instagram today because I had <laughs> a bit of a snafu this morning. I came to the office and I forgot to bring my other telephone because I need two phones to be able to run both simultaneous, simultaneously. But um, I've got everything I need here and it's going to be recorded. So if you want to watch it later, you can watch it later as well. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and it looks like a lot of people are signing on already. So that's great. And I'm going to go ahead and put it on the uh, presentation. But uh, great to see everyone. It's been a while. I've been back at work now for about a month or so. And uh, it's been nice. <laughs> it's Things are starting to get a little bit more back to normal. We actually had a company like gathering where everyone stayed six feet apart, but it was great to do that. And while I'm here, I might as well show you guys around a bit. Let's see. We don't have to wear a mask anymore here in Orange County. So I guess I can flip this around for you guys. So this is my office. <laughs> and um, we have a pool table and we actually had a pool party on Friday. And so, uh, so we're just waiting for everyone to gather, get everyone here. This is my office. I've been out of this office for, gosh, it's about eight years now. And um, so we run a bunch of different companies out of this office. We have uh, 16 different companies that run out of this office. So we have a nice view of the road and John Wayne Airport, not very far away. And here's a bunch of our different companies that I'm involved with. Uh, either as a founder or as, a, um, as an investor. And um, it's good to have you guys here. Here's a piece of art that I made. And you can tell I like surrealism. So, okie doke. Let's go ahead and get started. There's one of my 3D printers. And let's go ahead and put this on here. Here we go. All right. Looks like we've got quite a few people signed up on here already. All right. So here we go. So I've been uh, doing a lot of work, as you guys probably have noticed, related to electromagnetism um, and also um, the two different types of waves. So I'm going to give you kind of a, an overview on the types of waves that they're are right now that people understand and, and the scientific community accepts. So basically we have, um, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. And, and what you're looking here is at transverse waves. So you can see here, there's a line here that starts with 10 to the third, kind of the smallest value here. And it goes up to 10 to the 22nd power. Then you have a line value down here, which is actually the wavelength. So this would be frequency and this is wavelength value. And that's signified by this symbol lambda. Frequency would be, um, you know, as we think of it, uh, related to kind of like the number of beats per second. And so that's going to be number of, uh, you know, uh, you know, in this case of sound, it's like number of beats per second. So 432 beats per second. And then you've got speed, um, which is going to also be velocity. Uh, and, and, and that's going to basically be, you know, meters per second. So we're doing this in, in meters. And then we've got a wavelength value, which is lambda. And so basically you could kind of consider all of this related to electromagnetic waves. And the speed of light is approximately 3 times 10 to the 8th power. Now Einstein referred to the speed of light as 3 times 10 to the 8th power. He resisted going to 2.99792. I don't know why, maybe he thought that, uh, as some of my colleagues do as well, that it seems kind of funny that we would have something so close to three and not just call it three. Having said that, um, one of the things that you notice here is that this is the frequency line and this is the wavelength line. Now this is not for what we would consider sound waves. So uh, while it is very widely recognized or understood within the more new age community that there's a link between sound and light and and people that experience synesthesia will listen to music and see colors and so there's just no scientific tie that connects 
those two different types of waves. And I'm going to talk about those two different types of waves in just a moment. But as you can see here, radio frequency waves are kind of in this 10 to the third power up to 10 to the ninth power. Then we have microwaves that goes from 10 to the ninth to 10 to the 10th. Then infrared, which is 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 14th. And then we have something called the visible spectrum. So that's 10 to the 14th, 10 to the 15th power. Now, I've worked in the laser industry for, geez, almost 30 years. And I worked at a company called Coherent. And I was head of, uh, for a while, strategy and business development and also uh, research. And, and so I've done a lot of work in this field of visible light and invisible light, both in the infrared spectrum as well as in the ultraviolet spectrum. And I had this dream like 20 five years ago or so, that one day we'd be able to figure out DNA to the point where instead of using things like um, you know, pharmaceuticals and drugs, we could actually use electroceuticals, um, that we'd be able to titrate or turn on markers or turn off markers in our uh, genetic makeup, phenotypic expression or genotypic expression, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, you know, some titration or like playing DNA like he's on a piano keyboard, for example. So inside this, we have the visible spectrum, which would be the rainbow colors right down here. And remember, this is just the frequency. This is the wavelength down here. So they're linked together. Now you'll notice that the values are slightly different, right? So you got 10 to the negative seventh here, <clears throat> right? And then 10 to the 15th. So the difference is gonna be, you know, in the, zo in the zone of like eight, an order of 10 to the eighth power. The reason is, is because you've got light and the speed of electromagnetism is a wave that is always, you know, approximately three times 10 to the eighth power. So that's why you got these differences here in value. So one's taking out the other. So what's left over, right, is gonna be uh, 10 to the eighth when you put these against each other, which is basically C equals frequency times lambda, the wavelength. Now, another thing that's interesting about this is you get beyond the visible spectrum, you get to ultraviolet, which would be like black lights and x-rays, uh, dentist visits, so you're going to the airport, TSA, and in here at gamma rays, that little symbol here is a Greek letter gamma, gamma is from quasars, and cosmic rays. And so these are kind of the, 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 the farthest end, at least as we understand it, of the electromagnetic spectrum right now. And radio waves are down here, but another interesting characteristic of this is that in the visible spectrum, we can experience this notion of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle where we can experience wave particle duality. So uh, based on our own observation, uh, we could see you know, certain parts of the universe acting after we've observed it as particles versus acting as waves. So it's a wave of potential until it snaps into a particle and that's called collapsing the wave function. Right, so this is what we saw in the double slip phenomenon. We talked about it on philosophical geometry uh, class. And, and I applied a number theory to this that is using X and one over X. You might remember that. So inside this visible spectrum of light, we can experience both discrete and continuous. So continuous would be a manifestation of a wave. It would be infinite. Um, and then uh, discrete, would be you know a, a discrete value. So for example, if you looked at the number seven, the number seven has an X value that equals seven, and it's one over X value is 0 0.142857142857142814, uh, basically extending infinitely as a period of six digits that they just repeat forever. And this becomes the continuous aspect of the discreteness of seven. Now, Binary numbers have this unique characteristic in that, you know, one doubles to two, two doubles to four, four doubles to eight, eight doubles to 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, and 4096. And those are all numbers that we would recognize from com computation. And they're also used in encryption, which is one, one of the things I do every day. So basically, one of the things that makes those binary expansions so unique is that they have this property that their one over X value is also discrete. So it's not a wave like this. That's why it's kind of perfect for computation. I don't know how it got chosen that way in, in binary computing, but, but certainly it's, it's, it's wonderful for that. It's also wonderful because it's what waves are created off of. Waves propagate through doubling mathematics. And Walter Russell did a lot of work on that 
Uh, he didn't do a lot of work related to mathematics. He didn't leave us a lot of mathematics, but he left us enough breadcrumbs to figure out the math that he was thinking about. And, and so basically what you have is this wave doubling math, which is then all waves are going to propagate according to this wave doubling math. And, and we also would say that in this realm right here, we have both expressions. So pre-observation, then post-observation, you could say everything pre-observation could be a wave and everything post-observation could be a particle. But even light itself, does light actually travel? No, light doesn't actually travel at all because it's not like there's a photon that's like independent flying through either space or flying through air. Uh, that's not how it works. Basically, it's a wave uh, energy perturbation that's go or disturbance going through a medium, right? And in this case, you know, if it's air outside, the medium is air. Or if it's vacuum, then it's vacuum. Light and electromagnetism is thought to be the only way for there to be a wave to propagate, you know, somehow light could propagate through vacuum, even though there's not supposed to be anything in vacuum. And that's why this term, the luminous, the num, I can never pronounce this right, luminiferous, the luminiferous ether was a term that was used in the, you know, early uh, 20th century, late 19th century by physicists to explain how it was that even light could propagate through a, uh, through a vacuum. But we think of photon as a particle and it's a, it's a massless particle. But at the same time, arguably, you could say that there's probably no such thing as photon. Light itself is the wave, because you could say that there's a, in this field, right, there is a on excitation and an off excitation, and that light itself is simply that which is traveling, right, through this perturbation of energy that's uh, basically turning on and off the field around it as it goes along, right? And, and that's really kind of an interesting way to think about it because that means it's consistent with how we see with waves, you know, if uh, in the ocean even. So, you know, I said this in the class before that if you have a tsunami in Japan and it's headed for California, are the waves that land on the shores of California waves from Japan? Are they water molecules from Japan? Well, no, of course they're not. They are the water molecules that, are, that were in Japan when the earthquake started off the shores of Japan are still there off the shores of Japan. They just go, you know, as part of the wave. <laughs> That's it, they, they stayed. It's kind of like the wave in a, in a uh, stadium, a football stadium. When you go around and do the wave, you're not traveling around with the wave. You just kind of stand up and sit down, stand up and sit down. And it's the same thing with this on off position that's happening with light. And it's the same thing that's happening with anything related to the electromagnetic waves. Another thing is people ask me all the time about 5G. Well, 5G is kind of sitting right over here in this, you know, microwaves range, uh, which is also next to oven. And you got Wi-Fi in there too. So, you know, not just Wi-Fi, but 5G. You know, that's kind of a, an interesting microwave uh, level. And there's a lot of people that have concerns about this. Now, we tend to think that the visible waves are the ones that are most challenging to us, but actually, you know, we, 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 we all know that ultraviolet light is, is kind of a, a silent and, and invisible killer, right? You can get cancer from that. The Egyptians figured out several thousand years ago that if you suffer from plaque psoriasis, you sit out in the sun, you can actually get rid of your, your plaque psoriasis. But at the same time, when you start talking about ionizing rays, right, like X-rays, gamma rays, these rays could be dangerous because they can be carcinogenic. They can cause cancers, right? And, and they can cause mutations in our own cells. So those are obviously the challenging area. But for some reason, our FCC believes that, you know, kind of everything over here is safe and, and, and non-problematic. Now, again, I'm just trying to give you guys a background on this. Now, another thing that's interesting is that you've got wave particle duality that happens right here in the visible spectrum because that's what we can observe. So the parts that we can't observe arguably don't really have the wave particle duality in the same way because observation is defining in some way, shape or form, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle here, where our perception is defining, defining our observation experience. But over here in the radio frequency, microwaves and infrared, uh, you know, coming up to infrared, you've kind of got a, it's always looking like wave behavior. So wave behavior, radio waves act always like waves. And, and over on the far end of the spectrum, uh, out by gamma rays and, and, and cosmic rays, et cetera, 
you've got particle-like behavior, so much so that when you look at gamma rays, in fact, uh, they look like bullets that have been sprayed across, you know, like a metal plate or something. Uh, and that's, that's why I wrote bullets here. Now, I started using uh, Maxwell's equations, and that's what all this stuff is down here, right, which is energy density, electric energy and density, and magnetic energy and density. And I was playing with this uh, yesterday, just again, and, and I wanted to kind of like figure a few things out because I was feeling like there must be some connection between uh, the electromagnetic waves and then the other kind of wave, which is what we call sound waves, right? Or they might be referred actually as longitudinal or compression waves. So we have transverse waves, which is what all of the electromagnetic spectrum. So everything I just showed you is a wave that looks like this, right? So it's obviously got like a curve of linear nature. It's a, a, around an axis here. And, and you've got a directional, uh, uh, you know, of, of the, of, of basically the disturbance of the wave is going either up or down. That's why these arrows are going up and down like right here. And the wave is kind of going this direction. And so one of the unique characteristics of a transverse wave of electromagnetism is that it, it holds the characteristic that it will always be perpendicular, right, to the direction of the wave. So it's perpendicular, it's going, kind of going up and down, and it's at a 90 degree angle with the direction of the wave, okay? Now, I mentioned that C equals frequency over lambda, which is three times 10 to the eighth, or 299,792,458. And I remember that one pretty easily because that's also the exact uh, latitude of the Great Pyramid uh, in Giza. So it's 29.9792458 degrees north. So what's going on here though, between this difference between, you know, these these compression waves that look like this, that kind of look like A's and M's, you know, they're, they're, they're scalar, they're, they're pointy, they've got a jagged, a sawtooth kind of a look to them, right? And, and, and so these are not supposed to be convertible between transverse waves and uh, with waves of sound that would be longitudinal or compression waves. And these would be scalar uh, waveforms. And this is very unique in that unlike the electromagnetic waves, right, which have, you know, an axis of electricity and then an axis, axis of magnetism, electricity, magnetism, electricity, magnetism, and then alternating back and forth, this has this kind of like square boxy shape. And, um, and from the work that we did on Leonardo da Vinci and the, the square and the circle, this is basically controlled clearly by Euler. And it's also controlled by binary wave doubling as well. So the binary wave doubling is impacting both sides of this. But we've got this curvilinear nature here, which is giving it this trinary nature and pi is close to three. And so three is always gonna give us some sort of number that's gonna be more circular. Three is also a feminine number versus two being a masculine number. So the speed of light, as I mentioned, three times 10 to the eighth power, and it also happens to be 432 squared in miles per second, is, is you know, very different, or supposed to be, from the speed of sound, right? So the speed of sound, and sound, you know, there's that old movie, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Aliens? <laughs> and in Aliens, they used to advertise it and say, in space, no one can hear you scream because there's no, there's no sound propagation in space, right? So basically, it's just like you'd never hear anything when someone screamed in space because there's nothing to vibrate. And these compression waves have this characteristic, so they'll carry energy with them, and they'll have like a compression, and then it widens out, and the compression again, and then it widens out again. And again, these are parallel to wave. Now, what I was trying to do is say, okay, what would be the connection between these two? Now, as I mentioned on the prior page, You've got this, right, and this, and they're always going to be an offset difference of 10 to the eighth power, right? Because that's going to be the speed of light itself. It's going to be right down in the center of those, those two things, right? So normally, if you're going to be solving for a, um, you know, if I'm going to be solving 
for I want to know the wave uh, interval or the wavelength of a sound wave, right? I'm, I'm going to basically take the actual frequency, right? Divide it by its velocity. And then I'm going to uh, have that be equal to, so the frequency divided by velocity is going to be equal to its wavelength, this lambda value right here. Now, if you take 432 hertz, for example, divided by 344, and it depends on what kind of medium you're talking about. You can be talking about, um, you know, the most common medium would be the one where, you know, I'm sitting in right now, which is, you know, kind of room temperature, about 20 degrees Celsius, and that 20 degrees Celsius uh, traveling through air as my medium for the speed of sound. So in that context, speed of sound is going to be about 343, uh, 344 meters per second. That's going to be the speed of sound. So I could basically take 432, divide that by 344, and I get 7986. And so if you look up on the internet right now, the uh, the wavelength of 432 hertz, you'll find some papers on there basically saying that it's 79.86 uh, centimeters. And that's kind of like the normal expression. But what I did yesterday that was very different was I decided to apply 432 against the transverse wave and use the speed of light against 432 and just see what happens with ratios. Because everything in the universe is ratio-based, literally everything is ratio-based. So what I got was as follows. I took 299,792, 299,792,458, which is speed of light, divided by 432. Now we already know 432 relates to light speed, but via mile calculation, not the meter calculation. But I'm using meters here because it's gotta stay consistent, right? The units here have to stay consistent. So what I got out of that was an answer that comes out to 693964, 023. And, and when I take that and multiply it by 10 to the negative fourth, the, the, the answer comes out to 69.3964. Now, that put it in a similar category to 79.86, but still not the same value. What is the difference so that I could basically bring transverse waves together with longitudinal waves when I'm looking at something like the common 20 degrees Celsius and air as the medium for that wave propagation? Now, I should just mention that gravitational waves were discovered and there was a Nobel Prize uh, given for it to physicist Kip Thorne, who I met with a few years ago uh, with Nassim Hermain. And those gravitational waves are believed to be compression waves. In fact, they are believed to be vacuum fluctuations themselves. So everyone thinks that the vacuum, uh, you know, is nothingness. Well, actually it's not. It's kind of like the math equation zero to the power of zero. You could say that's vacuum and zero to the power of zero equals one. So that's not nothing. And so, so basically what, what, what has been found is that these waves in gravitation are believed to be, and they could only possibly be, compression waves of the vacuum itself. So vacuum fluctuation is how it's often referred. So but in this case, we're talking about the difference between 432 hertz and light speed in meters per second and see what we come up with. We get this number here. And so then I, of course, took that 69.3964023 and divided it by 79.86, the stated value of the, the, the wavelength of uh, 432 hertz. And that gives me a value of 0.8689758. Now, it just so happens I've been doing a ton of work over the last few weeks because of the Da Vinci work on this particular number, this 0.86 number, and we know that's not the same as 0.864, which would be, uh, you know, related to the sun and, and has so many different uh, correspondences in time, etc. So 86,400, yada, yada. But actually, I noticed that this is exactly the solution to this equation. So the square root of 3 divided by 2 plus the square root of the square root of 3 divided by 10 times 10 to the negative 2. And this is just scaling. So you can kind of take these two pieces out of this equation, right? It just gives you scaling perspective, but this is a very balanced looking type equation. So you've got a value, and we see this with math constants a lot, where you start to see this oscillation value as a fractal form of the original value. 
And of course, this, this relates back to um, the hexagon and pentagon, which I'll show you in a moment, and why that relates. Those numbers relate specifically to hexagon and pentagon. So basically what I'd found was that, you know, this relationship here ends up being, so if you take this value, this value, right, you end up with a value that, that comes out to be um, 0.38196, it's 0.38165 approximately, uh, times two, which gives you 0 0.763928440900. Now I recognize that number right away, right? Because if when I cut that in two, because anytime I see a number, the first thing I do is I cut it in two to see what its octal relationships are. The next thing I do is I double it. And then the next thing I do is I, I square it and then I square root it. And then sometimes if I can't find any correspondences there, I'm looking for cubes and cube roots, right? And I'll keep going until I find a correspondence because every number has some sort of essence associated with it. And you can find out a lot from that number in its essence. And you can also use digital root mathematics to then find patterns around it, turn it into mod nine, see what the sum of its digits add up to. So I noticed this, you know, 0.7639284409000. Uh, right, was actually just 0.381964, right? which of course I recognize right away because that is one minus little phi. So phi being 0 0.618033987, that's one minus little phi is giving me this value right here, which is the same, right, as coming out of this calculation right here, right, which gave me this 0 0.8689, you know, et cetera. So 0 0.86897, which is the same one from down here, 0.86897. So all I did was take the lambda value in transverse centimeters. Now, another thing I noticed that was very bizarre is when I took the lambda value in transverse centimeters and I took its one over X value, the one over X value for lambda value in transverse centimeters comes out to be 0.00000144. And I was like, wait, what? How is that even possible, right? So all I did was I took this number right here, the 69.39, which was derived simply as speed of light divided by 432, right? So that value right there in its one over X form comes out to five zeros and 144. And 144 we know is one of the Pythagorean tuning numbers, right? So I was like, that's really super bizarre. Because now that's showing up also as relational to Pythagorean tuning. And why is that? So the plot thickens. So here's the hexapentacus geometry again, and, and, and what we've got here, and this time the, the pentagon is inscribed within a circle, inscribed within the hexagon, inscribed within a circle. And what's interesting about this is that if I take a, and use the value of one from the, for the radius, for the hexagon, so out here to the corner, right, of the, uh, of the hexagon, and I'm gonna use that value as one, then because this, the, the pentagon is inscribed within the circle within that hexagon, it will have a value of 0.866, and that 0.866 is square root of three over two. So this is a geometric relationship. Now, we could take that, and for that differential between transverse and longitudinal waves that I just basically found, which works for everything that is working at, uh, at a speed of 343 meters per second in 20 degrees of air, uh, 20 degrees Celsius, rather, of air, then basically I could say, okay, if I'm going to take this fractal and add it, right, in the way that I just showed in that prior equation, it comes out perfectly to that same 0 0.86897, 0 0.86897, and that's derived from this equation right here, which is a fractal within a fractal of that same square root of 3 divided by 2. Another thing that's interesting is that 432 also as a circumference will have a diameter that is 137.50987, which is the golden angle. And the other way to derive the golden angle is to simply say one minus phi equals 0.381966. So, and then multiply that by 360 degrees and you have the golden angle, right? So here we are back at the hexapentacus, which 
we know has so many fundamental aspects associated with it. Well, let me just basically cut to another section here because you might have seen this last week. And this is when I started playing with, you know, the number 72 in particular. And because what I was trying to do is, is one of the things that we noticed was that prime factors show up in the one over X reciprocal values of semi-prime numbers infinitely. They show up in their period length as well. And, and sometimes that, they're, they're showing up many, many times, sometimes billions of times within their period. So we wanted to understand this. So we were looking at a math proof uh, over the weekend as well called Fermat's Little Theorem to see if Fermat's Little Theorem might help, you know, answer some questions we've got about this. But what we found is that we can rotate these strings as well. So that semi-primes and primes have have strings of numbers that we call rotational symmetry, and we can jump within those strings by simply multiplying them by binary expansions and sometimes trinary expansion numbers. So that would be two to its powers or three to its powers. But we also ran a test to see which ones land us closest to the prime factors. So we find, you know, there's a new way to factor primes that we do. And what we found is that multiples of 72 have this unique characteristic. And, and that was kind of interesting for us. And we're like, well, why is that? Is it because 72 has a lot of factors? And so just by chance, you're going to end up with a lot of numbers that would land within the 1 over x string that has both, you know, the prime factors showing up. But there's something unique about 72 because 72 is 2 to the third power times 3 to the second power. So you've got this perfect mirror symmetry going on here. So... I started drawing out this like musical ratios table that was only kind of half, uh, you know, when I'd ever seen it before, it was kind of half done. And, and then I took it even farther and took it all the way out to, you know, 72 by 72, which took me a long time to, to write all that stuff out. But you'll see here that it's like one to one is 72 and then two to one is 144. And that's just two times 72, three times 72 and four times 72. You'll notice all these numbers, 144, 216, 288, 360, 432, 504, 576, 648, 70, uh, 720, 792 and 864. And, and these numbers are you know, numbers that we all know so well because 864 is 86,400 seconds in a day. 792 is 11 times 72, and it happens to be the diameter of Earth, 7,920 miles. Uh, 720 is just 10 times the, the arc length of the Pentagon, right? 72 degrees, and 720 is also the sum of angles of a hexagon. And each of these numbers, and this is 24 times 24, and it's also a musical note. So these are both musical notes, and also they have planetary relationships. <laughs> You know, for example, uh, Mercury is 36 million miles from the sun. And 432,000 miles is the radius of the earth, of the, of the, of the sun, excuse me. 216, well, that has two uh, very important references. One is to earth and the other is to the moon. The diameter of the moon is 2,160 miles. And the, the circumferential, equatorial circumferential measurement in nautical miles of the earth is 21,600. It also relates to a compass. 144, you know, that also is relational to the number of, uh, you know, minutes that we have in a day, which is uh, 14, uh, 1440. So basically, you know, all these numbers were showing up as kind of interesting and unique patterns, right? So we've got 864, then you got 12 to the 2, so then you just divide that. So uh, as the way the ratios work, so 432, 288, 216, and now we're at 1728, which is the same as 864 times 2 but it's also, you know, um, 12 times 72 divided by five. So then we've got 144, 123.42, 108, which is the inner angle of the Pentagon versus the outer angle, right? It's angle of incidence being 72 degrees and the arc length of its side being 72 degrees. And now we're at 10, right? So uh, uh, 864 divided by 10 is 86.4. I started noticing some other things about this too. So 12 to the 11 gives me 78.54. And 78.54 is uh, exactly pi over four. So just with a decimal position move, 0.785399 is what 
is what that value is. So this is kind of unique. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. So using 72, I'm starting to see some math constants come out. And I saw some other things that kind of stuck out to me, like 52.36. Well, that happens to be the exact cubit measurement versus a meter, which is 0.5236. And it's also pi divided by six, gives you 0.5236. 3927 is another number we see a lot because when we're looking at prime factorization inside of reciprocal value strings, the number of times it shows up is always 0 0.00003927, which that's the number of uh, prime factors that show up. So this, there's two in a encryption. So you've got um, prime factor one and prime factor two and prime factor one palindrome, which is just a permutation of that same number, uh, the first prime, and then prime factor two palindrome. And if you add up the total number of primes and uh, prime palindromes that show up in a one over x reciprocal string, it always comes out to a number with the number of zeros before it and then three nine. Sometimes it shows up as four o oh, or three eight nine, but it's always in this zone. And if you add a one to the front of that, so 1.3927, and then take its one over x value, not surprisingly, it gives you 72. <laughs> it gives you uh, 0.718. And that's basically the Euler fractal. So Euler minus two, which also gives you 72. I also noticed here 26.18, which is phi squared, right? And that's interesting because it's showing up on this chart. So I, I kind of came away thinking, well, maybe if I extend this chart all the way out, every major math constant will come out on here. And sure enough, that's exactly what it does. So 72 is this very, very unique number, right? It, it is super important. Okay, now keep that in mind. Let's go back to this. So here we go. Formula conversion between transverse and longitudinal waves of sound. So what is the wavelength of 432 hertz? The wavelength, right, could be derived as 299.792.458, that's light speed. And I'm gonna solve for lambda, which comes out to that number I told you, 69.396 centimeters. And one over lambda equals 144. <laughs> that's kind of remarkable. I would have expected it from miles, but I didn't expect it so perfectly from meters. So that was kind of a mind blower for me. Secondly, we do the same thing. And of course the conversion factor of, of uh, uh, a meter, right? Uh, or centimeter to an inch is 2.5399555. Okay, so just, it's one of those ones you just wanna kind of commit to memory. And so what, what is the wavelength then? What is the lambda for 864 Hertz? All right, again, at room temperature and here, the one over lambda, this gives me 3469, 82. And the one over lambda there is giving me again 288. <laughs> that seems like an interesting coincidence again, but of course that's just a doubling, wave doubling. So I wasn't reading too much into it at that stage. But then I wanted to know, because you might remember a few weeks ago, I was uh, trying to solve for how long it takes for light to travel one foot. And I was kind of blown away when I discovered that light travels one foot in right approximately 10 to the negative nine seconds. So it's like one times 10 to the negative nine seconds, which is kind of weird because the Planck length also, if you look it up on Google, you know, it's 1.616. And I actually believe we've solved the number it should be that goes out infinite because it's related to an irrational constant, which is tied to the square root or the fractal root of one and the square root of 10, which is, you know, 616-227766. So it'd be 1.616-227766. But I noticed that when you look at the mile measurement, just Google mile measurement for Planck length, and you're gonna get one times 10 to the negative 38th power. It's kind of remarkable. Like the mile, wasn't that just like, based on paces, you know, of Roman soldiers or something? Well, it turns out it must not be, right? There's, there's something more afoot here, no pun intended. So basically, um, I'm looking at this, and I thought to myself, if it takes one times 10 to the negative nine 
seconds, so that would be one billionth of a second, for light to traverse one foot of space time. What would it take, what is the interval or what is the wavelength for 432 hertz? Because we see this number over and over again, and I was just curious, I just wanted to know. And that's where I kind of got stunned because it came out to 31.44 inches. Now, we knew the stated value was already 79.86, and we knew that the conversion from 69.396, right, for longitude, longitudinal uh, wave value from uh, transverse to a longitudinal wave is going to be this 0.86897, right, which is that square root of 3 divided by 2 number with the fractal of square root of 3 divided by 2. And what I then found was that you know, if you just make a conversion on your calculator, you could actually look on Google and Google what is 79.86 centimeters in inches, and that's what it gives you, right? So that's pi times 10. Now that's weird because I remember when I went to the Great Pyramid and uh, I was looking at the measurements of the King's Chamber, and, you know, of course it's 60 cubits as its perimeter, but 60 cubits comes out exactly to pi times 10. Now, is that a coincidence? Uh, you know what? Lots of people actually believe that it is. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about like, you know, two or three decimal points of accuracy. It's more accurate than even this, right? Because this is 3144. That's actually closer to Jane's value of pi. It's definitely in the range of pi, but it's not a perfect pi, right? And so I, 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 I remember thinking about this at the Great Pyramid and saying, well, geez, you know, the, the, um, the fractal root, right, so this would be two numbers multiplied by each other that give uh, a value, and those two numbers multiplied by each other are separated by one decimal position. So 3.16227766 times 0.316227766 equals 1. So it's a new way the universe uses the exact same numbers to arrive at the value of 1. It's not just 1 times 1 equals 1. It's also 3.16227766 and 0.316227766, and, and my colleague and I, Talal Guanam, wrote a paper on this fractal root of numbers. So it's a different way of looking at numbers, and it works at all scales. So the fractal root of pi is actually 5.605, which is kind of fascinating because there's that hexagon-pentagon thing again, and it's the foundation of all life because DNA is based off of that, and so... 5.605 squared gives me 31.4. Um, and, and the number of inches of the Alpha Omega in the Great Pyramid was 5.605. That was the width. And I thought, well, there's obviously a tie to the perimeter of the King's Chamber, because the King's Chamber is pi in meters. Well, that's where I got pushed back, because even though it's a perfect 31 point for one five nine two six five three five meters, uh, everybody looked at me like I was nuts, right? And they're like, "No, that can't show their intention because that just was a pure coincidence." I'm like, "Okay, the mathematical probabilities. Obviously, the people that come up with all these ideas of coincidence don't understand mathematical probability because if they did, they wouldn't think it was coincidence." And I sometimes would like to joke for that crowd on uh, on Instagram and Facebook and such and I'll say oh is this a coincidence because I know there's no such thing as coincidence there never is you know uh, what is it randomness is the word we use to to describe something where we haven't found the pattern yet right it's it's that simple and I make random number generators even so so this was interesting to me so I thought okay I'm gonna pull on the string a little bit farther and see what happens because you know maybe I can now see something else in the rest of these number series so I've got, um, I decided to do this for the others as well to see what would happen. So remember that the, the, the one over lambda value in the transverse wave calculation against light speed uh, is basically giving me this 144 number for 432. And of course, that is a D note in Pythagorean tuning. So when I do halving and doubling on all of this, uh, I find that, you know, 216 hertz is giving me 0.72 as the inverse value of the, no, this is the 1 over lambda in transverse wave value, right? And then it goes 36 and 18. So these are all D notes. And then it's just doubling from here, right? So it was D, 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 D. 
But then looking at the lambda in inches, I also noticed something interesting because in Pythagorean tuning, if, if we're gonna take this and say, okay, this is 31.44 and we double it, it's gonna give us 62.88, right? And 62.88 is rounding to 63. And 63 is a C note in Pythagorean tuning. And you double it again and we've got 126, a C note in Pythagorean tuning. And then 252, which is a C note also in Pythagorean tuning. Then you also notice that there's mathematical correspondence here because you've got pi here, and I'll explain why in a moment this doesn't come out to exactly 31.4159, at least in my opinion. Um, but i show you how it, it comes super, super close to that. So you've got pi, and then this becomes a, a, a tau value, so 6.28, right, is tau, it's 2 pi. And then you've got uh, 126, which is pi times two to the, uh, to the second power. And then you've got pi times two to the third power, right? And of course, there, you just have to fractal this up in multiples of 10. And then you've got pi over two, which is what half of this is, so 15.72. And then 7.86, of course, that comes out to, because pi is so fundamental right at the center here, this comes out to the square root of phi. So the square root of little phi, six point, or 0 0.618, square rooted comes out to 7.86, or 0.786. And again, the decimal place doesn't really matter. So then you got 39.3, which is that same value I told you is, is the exact value that's like related to 72 and Euler number uh, in, in both directions. So it's Euler minus two. Uh, when you add one to the front of this and take its reciprocal, you're getting Euler minus two and the number 72. And then if you take it all the way down to 27 hertz, you've got a 504 inch lambda, which is again giving us a C note. So you've kind of got this full range now uh, on this. And these are all the Pythagorean tuning notes. Now, I noticed one other thing that I thought was really interesting is I wanted to know the peak of the wave or the middle of the wave because, and that would be somewhere between 432 and 216. And, and so what I did there was basically took ratios, which was, here's the 0.72, so I wanted to find the one value, right? So 0.72 times 62.88 gives us 45, and that is now informing an F sharp. 45 hertz is an F sharp. So now I've got, I've got a A note, these are all A notes, these are all C notes, these are all D notes, and now I have an F sharp that gets informed out of this wave. And obviously for those all to come out, kind of those numbers perfectly like that, was pretty remarkable uh, and surprising to me. Very, very surprising in fact. So the fact that all the Pythagorean tuning is lining up to this conversion, right, in the way that I just described, uh, was, was shocking to me. So what, what is really going on here? Well, that's when I started to refine this equation, right? And the equation is C in meters per second divided by, and this is the most simplistic way I could derive it, the square root of two times one minus phi times 10 to the 12th. And 10 to the 12th is five and six, right? That's just another doubling approach. And that gives us this 874,032. 049. And that turned out to be, right, so when you take that number, and I don't have my calculator because I'm using my phone uh, to film this right now, but when you take that number and you take the square root of that number, uh, sorry, the, you square that number, you end up with this 700, where'd it go? That's a long number. Uh, here it is. right here. So 763928440900 times 10 to the 12th power, right? That's why you've got this 10 to the 12th in here, right? So you take that 76, you cut it in half. Now you've got one minus phi, which is 0.3819. So one minus 0 0.618, 0 0.3819. 
And, and then that's why this works. Two times one minus phi, such a beautifully simple equation, times 10 to the 12th power, you know, and all of that square rooted, divided into the speed of light, is giving me now the longitudinal value for wave length. Now, this is the first time that I know of that anyone's tried to make a connection between transverse waves, which are those waves that have those circular shapes, which are made by pi, and waves that are made by Euler, which are the squares. And all of this derived because of the, the, uh, the rabbit hole that we went down, I guess, related to the da Vinci work, and which is very exciting. But another way to derive this would be the speed of light, which are referred to as T waves, transverse waves, divided by square root of two, times one minus phi times 10 to the 12th, 343 meters per second. These are the I waves or longitudinal waves, and it's a phi relationship between the two. And of course, phi is, phi is derived as one plus the square root of five divided by two minus one. So with that, there was a lot more I could have presented to you, but I didn't want to, uh, to overwhelm you guys too much. And, uh, but let me go ahead and answer any questions now that hopefully I can, uh, I can do for you guys because now I can actually see the phone again. Okie doke. Uh -oh. Hang on a second. Here. I have to balance this more. Okay. All right. Sorry, I would like to be able to see you guys a bit better, but let me see if I can get another book to put underneath here because it's about to fall over. Okie doke. All right. So. Let's see, Pythagorean tuning. So someone asked, what is Pythagorean tuning? Pythagorean tuning is the type of tuning that uh, was actually established by a fellow by the name of Pythagoras, a very, very famous Greek mathematician and philosopher in the uh, 6th century um, BC. And he's the one who came up and said, okay, the very first note that we can hear is 27 hertz. Now you might ask, and a lot of people have a lot of incredulity about this because they say, how did he even have the means to be able to hear how many beats per second there are? I mean, how can someone count that quickly? It's not really possible. But he did it all based on square root of 3 and the square root of 2 and all of those expansion values of 72. Now, one thing I want to mention is that music and geometry are basically the same thing. They're just two sides of the same coin. And... You could say actually music and math is two sides of the same coin and the middle of that coin is geometry itself. So geometry is the nexus, the connection between music and mathematics. And one of the things I noticed when I was looking at why is it that the prime factors show up in the one over X string, uh, defying all kinds of logic and everything. Uh, and you know, we spent a lot of time on this Fermat's little theorem and I was on the phone with a big time a uh, cryptologist on Friday, and he thought that there might be a connection uh, between Fermat's little theorem on that as well. So we spent the weekend kind of looking for that. But I think it comes down to something more simplistic, actually. I think it just comes down to geometry. So if you look at all geometry, the highest divisible factor of all geometry in the third dimension and higher is 720 degrees. Um, and at least that's for the third dimensional form. So those third dimensional forms would be three types of ge geometric uh, solids. One would be what we know as, as the platonic solid. So platonic solids would be, uh, you know, a cube, a tetrahedron, an octahedron, an icosahedron, and a dodecahedron, right? And, and if you kind of uh, start with the tetrahedron, the tetrahedron has 720 degrees as its sum of angles. The octahedron has double that, a 1440. Uh, the, the next one is uh, 2160, which is the cube. The next one is 3600, uh, which is the icosahedron, which also you'll hear about in the Archimedean solids is the, is the cube octahedron or the vector equilibrium. And then you have uh, 6480, which is the dodecahedron. It has 12 sides 
uh, and they're each pentagons. So 6480 is the sum of its angles. So every one of those numbers is divisible by, you know, 720. Maybe because a tetrahedron can make everything. And we've all heard this before, that the tetrahedron can, can accumulate together to form all of reality. You know, there's this great show on fractals on YouTube that you can find that talks about how the tetrahedron, you know, is the, the, the form structure, even in computation, where they're wanting to make, you know, virtual reality look as, as realistic as possible, right? And so the tetrahedron is sort of the foundational structure for all. And 720 is that kind of magical number. And it's also related to Euler minus two. That's the 718 in Euler minus two or 72. So, you know, you could look at those solids, the platonic solids, or you could go to the Archimedean solids, or you could go to the, uh, the, the Catalan solids. And the Catalan solids are solids that would be known as the Archimedean duels. And this is something that I just discovered, uh, you know, recently, because even though I knew about Archimedean duels and I knew about the Catalan solids, I never really studied them that much. Uh, so I wanted to understand, you know, this disdiacus dodecahedron, as well as uh, this structure that is, that is uh, you know, basically called a rhombic dodecahedron. And when I looked at the rhombic dodecahedron, I was kind of blown away because the rhombic dodecahedron, again, divisible by 720, has a sum of angles of its sides is uh, 4,320. So there's 432. Now it's the only geometry that I knew about like that. And, and it's, it happens to be an Archimedean dual of the cube octahedron, which is the vector equilibrium that is unique in that it is equidistant from each of its vertexes to its center. So I looked at that and I said, well, this has got to be kind of something important because the rhombic dodecahedron uh, has 24 edges that are identical, just like the cube octahedron does. And then I noticed that, that the rhombic dodecahedron has 12 sides instead of 14 sides of the cube octahedron. And it has uh, 14 vertices compared to 12 vertices of the cube octahedron. So it's kind of like a mirrored opposite of the cube octahedron. And the cube octahedron comes out of the vesica piscis, comes out, forms life, everything. And so when I looked at that, I was kind of blown away because I also learned that it's the only other uh, geometric solid besides the cube that can pack and stack without any uh, space in between. So that makes it a unique form and structure. So you've got kind of the platonic solids and then you've got this rhombic dodecahedron, which then allows a cube to transition into a dodecahedron. It's kind of the, the halfway point. So I was fascinated by that. But when you look at musical note tuning and take all of those values that I just said at platonic solids, and you take the values also of the Archimedean solids, you're gonna find perfect Pythagorean tuning values as the structure of, you know, uh, an F sharp major chord in five part harmony. So, you know, you, you take 720, 1440, 2160, and 3600, and you convert those values into Hertz frequency, and you've got a perfect F sharp major chord. Um, so not only are you like listening to this F sharp major chord, but what we're seeing in the form of those platonic solids uh, is basically the F sharp major chord as a visible construct. So, you know, geometry becomes the music that we can't hear. It's the music that we see. So geometry is the music that we see, and, and uh, music is the geometry that we listen to. So that's a way to think about this, because it's very, very powerful when you look at it in that context, that all of it matches. And if you're interested more in learning about this, there's a couple of books that I highly recommend. One being Quadrivium. I, I recommended it last week um, on, uh, on Instagram and got like 7,000 or 8,000 likes or something. I like that. So it means people know the book already. So that's good. Um, and then another book that I really highly recommend for this type of work as well is uh, Talal Guanam's book, The Mystery of Numbers. So that's where we can learn about digital root mathematics. And and uh, I'm going to be working on a new book here pretty soon uh, on mathematics that uh, I'm excited about and will be sharing with you guys. Hopefully it'll be done within a year or so. Uh, but it's going to kind of encapsulate all of this and um, very, very excited about the collaboration I'm working on that. But 
but actually when you when you look at how geometry beautifully meshes together with music it's just undeniable there's no way and then it makes you question why in the heck don't we use 432 hertz tuning because you're not making perfect geometry with 440 hertz tuning it doesn't work so this is a very very important nuance and uh you know some of my friends who are in the music industry in la have read the paper that i wrote and they've switched over uh, totally to 432 hertz tuning so that's been very exciting but pythagoras gave us this tuning which i think is giving us information that when combined with imperial measurement systems actually show us patterns and numbers that would suggest that there was a lot higher knowledge on the face of earth uh, thousands of years ago that went into all of our unique measurement systems of imperial measure, including time and space, everything about it. Uh, the Beatles used to play in 432. Yes, that is true. So did Verdi, so did Mozart, so did all of these guys. And, and you could ask, well, how did they know how to tune in that? that? They just, they figured it out. Uh, they, they knew it. So uh, very excited about that. But, you know, I think that as we look at the inch and the foot and the meter and the cubit, um, you know, it's funny because everyone always like, likes to go back and say, oh, the meter is where it's at. The meter is so easy because it's all five and 10. Well, actually it's a less superior, um, it's kind of an inferior measurement system. Because if you think about it, the thing you want to be measuring the most of is the thing that you want to be able to be broken into the most divisible factors, right? You want the most divisibility in these numbers. So we've discovered that there are 12 numbers in the first, you know, 1,080 integers. And those 12 numbers are actually determining prime distribution. Uh, those 12 numbers are inclusive of 144, right, of 216, of 432, of 864. All those numbers are very unique because they happen to be very, very highly divisible. Uh, and secondly, they're divisible by 24. So 72 is unique because it's divisible by both 36 and 24. So the mod 24, which is where we found the prime number pattern, is, uh, is, is a fundamental aspect of that that, that cannot be ignored. So, so basically, this, this notion of, of 72-ness is all related to geometry. And unless you're a multiple of 72, you're not going to be a regular geometry. Or 720, as the case may be in the third dimension. So another question. Okay, so the, the notes that are done here are in what's called Pythagorean just tuning. Just tuning needs to be uh, corrected very, very slightly using something called the Pythagorean comma. So if you're a musician and you want to be able to tune uh, to uh, Pythagorean just tuning, you could use 432 and you could also use the D note 288 to then tune all the rest of your notes. So you're going to have minor adjustments. Uh, using the Pythagorean comma, and the Pythagorean comma comes out to be 1.0136 is the, the value for these very small minute adjustments that even Pythagoras knew that you couldn't get everything perfect with only whole numbers. Uh, it won't sound perfect, but you could get pretty damn close to sounding perfect without any kind of sense on your musical tuning, which you know, I'm a musician too, and it works, uh, but you have to use a Pythagorean comma and you can use equal temperament on top of this just tooting to, to, to bring everything into a beautiful sounding uh, music. So I see Will Wire on there. Hi, Will. <laughs> Good to see you. And uh, Gabriel as well. Um, basically, I'm going to have to uh, cut off here in just a moment unless there's a few other questions. I think we still got a lot of people on here, but uh, I'm very excited because if we can connect transverse waves mathematically in the way that I've just suggested to uh, improve it and, and get a paper published on it, then, and it's a geometrical relationship, uh, both between, you know, this geometrical relationship of transverse to longitudinal wave, as well as uh, relational to this notion of inches and 432 coming out to being uh, very close to uh, pi, and I'll explain that one aspect of it that I forgot to mention too, which is 3.144. Now that's the Jane value of pi. You guys might recognize that, and Jane is one of my colleagues that I 
think very, very highly of, and uh, is, is awesome. He's outstanding. Well, Jane has for some time said that the true value of pi should be 3.144, and then there's, of course, more numbers behind that. And uh, his actually goes 3.1446, uh, and I don't remember all the rest of the numbers after that. But he says that that relates to the square root of phi, which of course is 1.272. So phi in this case being, or phi being 1.618033987, and its reciprocal value is 0 0.618033987. And he believes that uh, when you take the square root of phi, right, as opposed to four over pi, which is 1.273, that the better, more beautiful way relates to phi itself. It's so that pi becomes an expression of phi. And that doesn't surprise me, candidly, because if you think about it, if you take 261.8 degrees on a circle and you uh, divide that by 360, it gives you 0.7277 uh, as a value. And you multiply that, or you take the 1 over x value of that, and it gives you the golden angle of 137.51. But interestingly, what it also does is that if you take that same 0.7277 value and multiply it by 432, which is just a 6 over 5 relationship of the circle, you're going to get a number that's going to come out to be uh, 314.16 degrees. <laughs> so basically, you could say that the phi squared position divided into 360 upscaled to a 6 over 5 relationship of 432 is going to give you pi again, pi times 100. So that didn't surprise me at all because we also know that, you know, uh, pi divided by 12 gives us 0.2618. So obviously pi and phi are connected. There's no doubt about it. So pi divided by 12 is 0.2618, right? And then also, uh, you know, the other way you could derive that is simply pi over 6, which is the cubit measure of, against the meter, 0.5236, and you multiply that, or you cut that in half, rather, divide that by 2, and you've got 0.2618. So it's all over the place. And, and I think in that regard, Jane is definitely onto something. Now, as I look at it, what I've noticed is that there's a oscillation value that seems to be mirroring against our compass values. So we have, you know, 360 degrees on a compass, 60 minutes within a degree and then 60 seconds and so you've got a total value around the compass of 1.296 million um, you know seconds of of arc going around the circle now that's really important to recognize and understand because all time is actually based off of that so you could say that that's a 15 day cycle of 86,400 day cycles each one so 15 days like that so an inhalation exhalation that gives us our month and and then you've got you know 360 days in a year in the egyptian calendar and the sumerian calendar which gives us 8640 hours so 24 times 36 you know these numbers are all over the place and they had five days to sort of catch and make up but maybe there was a point in time in our history where there was only 360 days in a year i don't know but the, the, the point being that um, if you take a minute calculation, and the way you would run the minute calculation is you would take that last digit of 31.44, which is the inch measurement of the, uh, of the wavelength of 432 hertz. And what you would have is you would end up with uh, a value of 31, so that 0.4, multiply it by uh, 60, and you'll have 24. So you would have 31424, right? Or if you if you had, you know, 3144, uh, it could go as high as 3.1428, which would be the same as 22 over 7. So you've got an oscill oscill oscillation zone happening inside of here. And this I've seen with many, many math constants. You know, another example of this is that the slope angle of the Great Pyramid is, uh, can be derived as phi uh, divided by pi, which comes out to 5150, so 0 0.515036.
But if I put that into my computer, and you can find a, a page on your computer that actually allows you to make a conversion from decimal and compass and vice versa. And when you do that value into your computer, it's going to come out to 518436. So it, it actually is a mirror match, right? So pi you know, or phi divided by pi is the slope angle of the pyramid. It's just giving you a value that's in compass measurement. So 51 and 50 minutes. And so that 50 minutes would be 50 minutes and 36 seconds. Divide that into 60 minutes and you end up with 5184, 36. So I, I'm noticing that there's this oscillation zone that's defined and it's almost like it's so intentional and it's beautifully done. It's so perfect. How, how could it be, do, be done? I mean, that's what kind of is mind blowing for me. Um, but you're, divine, you're defining the rim or the outer rim of a vortex, you know, and, and by that same token, the square root of three divided by two equals 0.866. 432 squared equals 1.866. Now you can replace and you can take away the one you know, all day long with math constants like phi, you know, 1.618 or 0.618. Or, you know, Euler, 2.718 or 0.718. That's one of the unique characteristics for mathematical constancies. So when you look at that 0.866, I can get there through 432 squared. That just gives me 1.866. And I take the one off, and now I'm there, right? Uh, and, and so there you've got this relationship between 432 and the square root of 3 over 2. Okay? There's also a relationship in that 432 divided by, divided by uh, uh, 360 degrees gives us a 6 over 5 relationship or a 12 over 10 relationship. And that also relates back to the 3 and the 2 because 3 plus 2 equals five, three times two equals six. So there you have this divergence of wave, right? And then you got wave doubling on twos and, and wave doubling on threes, right? And wave doubling on threes is gonna give us multiples of 24. So in effect, what, what you've got is this relationship on 0.866, which is square root of three divided by two, and also all of the, you know, uh, 432 squared, and in addition to that, the golden angle multiplied by tau gives us 0.864. So if I took that 0.864 and use that as a minute value, the last four is a minute value, divide that into 60 minutes, that gives me 6.6. So now I'm back at 0.866 again. So these are all the same value. They're just adjusted kind of like this Pythagorean comma, but using this compass measurement to basically create this vortex, you know, and, and this oscillation zone just as we see with phi. You know, phi is not perfectly 1.618033987 going out infinitely. Uh, you know, is three a Fibonacci number? Yes. Is five a Fibonacci number? Yes. Is three divided by 5.618? No. Three divided by five is 0.6. And you get an oscillation zone, and then it tightens in. It gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter until it gets to this infinite irrational point. But for the universe, you know, for us, we're like, oh, well, eight digits, it's fine. You know, now we're, now we're there. But until then, it's not fine. Well, that's just how the universe works. It's, you, you could think of this as the, the top part of a tornado versus the base of the tornado, which is touching the earth. And the base of the tornado, which is touching the earth, is going to be this tight mathematical constant, which is going to be an irrational value, perfectly irrational value. And there are probably many, many other irrational values along the way within that vortex coming down. And we've seen that. So the top of the vortex is going to be defined as relational to the compass measure. And that's another thing that, you know, we're working on right now. So is this, uh, so this is all exciting because we are finding the vortex matrix construct of our reality. Well, okay. So let me go ahead and finish on this then. Here's what I'm trying to say. So here, you have transverse waves. You have longitudinal waves. Never the twain shall meet. Ah, until we realize that they're actually the same thing. They're related to each other. There's a construct that connects them that relates to the square root of three divided by two and a vortex that comes off of that. Transverse waves is what we associate with light, matter, radiation, and energy. Compression waves is what we associate with mass, gravitation. Think about things like Higgs boson, Higgs field, time space, vacuum, and scalar waves. What if the two are actually just mirror 
reflections of each other. That would point to some notion of fitting into some form of a holographic universe. And, you know, by the way, I'm not the only one to say this. There's a lot of mainstream scientists who believe this now. You know, but the way the mainstream works is they're kind of the last ones to come to resolution on things. It's, it's usually the intuitives, the artists, the, the people who are psychic, who figure things out. That's why when I posted a few weeks ago that, you know, now time has been observed to go backwards, I thought it was funny because I, I posted it because I talked about that. I said that was coming soon. And, and now it's kind of becoming more and more. There have been many, many articles on that in the last few weeks. And the point that I want to make there is that, you know, when science finally gets around to confirming something, unfortunately, it's not really new science anymore at that stage, right? It's, uh, it's kind of like yesterday's newspaper to a certain extent. And so people that were not surprised when they saw, oh, well, the past, present, and future are one, and, and maybe, you know, what we consider the distant past might actually be our far future. Maybe we're all flat timers. <laughs> We talk about flat earthers, but maybe we're all flat timers because we are perceiving time as linear when actually it doesn't really make any sense for it to be perfectly linear. It doesn't make any sense for it at all to be perfectly linear because if the universe is a torus, if our galaxy is a torus, uh, then it should not be because space and time are attached together. If I fire a photon that then travels on a wave propagation because the photon is not traveling, at some stage, if I live long enough, I should be able to see that photon boomerang back at me because the universe is curved. And, you know, maybe we're just going through a large inhalation cycle versus a large exhalation cycle, and we're just not living long enough to see the arc of that inhalation exhalation cycle. Maybe, um, just like some people believe that the Earth is flat, and they thought that space, our space here on Earth, was flat, until you start traveling around the world and you realize that if I fly west, I end up east. If I fly north, I end up south. But maybe it's the same thing with time. And maybe we don't have to worry about all these grandfather paradoxes that come up in sci-fi films, etc. But I do believe that we are rapidly, rapidly getting cutting-edge science. Now, none of this is what I'm saying to you is peer-reviewed. I just discovered it yesterday. And so one of the things that's really advantageous about uh, Facebook and Instagram is that when I get information, I could share it with you right away. Uh, that's a big advantage, you know. People throughout history, if they've been able to do that, maybe we wouldn't be stuck in some of the areas of darkness that we've been stuck in. Or maybe when we learn things, we could actually institutionalize them in ways that didn't have to only be through the academic sector. And I think that there's something irrevocably challenged right now uh, related to academia. Uh, I think that it's a structure that you know, believes it's in a unique position of saying what is truth versus what is not truth and science is, you know, science as science gets. Uh, to me, science is really just a word that we use to describe a consensus opinion that will likely change as we get more and more information. Because the only constant, even in the context of mathematical constants, what I'm trying to say to you about this vortex, you know, verticular nature of mathematical constants, even those constants are the, are changing. <laughs> So change in itself is the only constant. So with that, uh, I do think that the world is going through a dramatic shift. I think that governments are in the same situation. People don't wanna to be told anymore what they can and can't think about of what is correct and what is moral from either a religious perspective or they don't wanna to be told what is lawful. People want to be involved in community. The demonstrations are a perfect example of this, but few people wanna be involved in government. Um, I certainly don't. And you know, from that perspective, education and, and the university system also is very challenged right now because it is thinking that it's been in a unique position to determine what is truth in education versus what is mistruth in education. And yet, that's the same group that is, is trying to change our own history, you know, in Texas. <laughs> I was laughing when my parents told me that they changed the school curriculum to say that there was no slavery Slavery didn't exist. Um, it was, you know, Texas imported migrant workers. And that's the history that's now being taught in Texas. There was no slavery in Texas. So from that perspective, um, everything becomes subjective to whatever we believe 
benefits us. And that is the reality that I think we all need to come to. None of us are perfect. All of us, every one of us, me, most of all, right? I made tons of mistakes in my life. I've done all kinds of things wrong. I've committed sin. Does that make me evil? Maybe, partially. Does it make me really good because I said that, you know, I, I, I did something and I thought, okay, I, I'll say 10,000 Hail Marys and now I'm forgiven? No, it doesn't make me any different. And the key is to accept ourselves for who we are, not for who we think we might be as a better version of ourselves. You know, the better version of ourselves that is waiting within us is that you are an understanding that you are what you've been looking for. And just accept that. And that's the beauty that is coming into the world today and coming into focus. We don't need to be told. Uh, and we don't even need to be taught, candidly, because... In the world today, you know, you can learn so much just on your own. And I, I think there needs to be a whole new paradigm. I'm not saying get rid of schools, just I'm not saying defund the police. Although I was really not happy about what happened in Atlanta yesterday. But at the same time, I fundamentally believe that we have control over our own destinies. We are the masters of our fate. We are the captains of our own soul. Um... Someone asked, oh, one last question, it's interesting, have I looked at the periodic waveforms of, uh, of periodic table of elements? Yes, in fact, I've actually made my own version of that, uh, and there's actually a film on it that uh, Hold My Arc from, uh, from Instagram made a great version of it that's on my Instagram. Uh, it's on Instagram in the IGTV section, and it's also on YouTube on my channel, Robert Edward Grant. I'm going to go, go ahead and go now, guys. So great to see you all. Hope you all have a wonderful day. And um, remember, fall in love with yourselves. Have a good one. Bye.